my goodness, I'm so grateful for the worship that we experience here at Messiah. And I pray that you're encouraged, that you feel closer to God as a result. Hey, just before we get into this morning's message, as we continue in our Family Affairs series, today I'm talking about uh, favoritism in the family and more about that in just a moment. But right now I wanna talk about re-entry at Messiah Community Church. Things are heating up, things are getting back to normal but things will never be the same way that they were. But we are looking at how to re-enter. We want you to be a part of an interest meeting on re-entry if you are interested in serving. Hey, we're gonna need all hands on deck because we still gotta bring this good news, this gospel to people. Paul said um, that we're to bring it. He said, I became all things to all men that by all means I might save some. Some people need a, uh, an online worship experience. Some people need an in-person worship experience and we're called to reach people in the space where they uh, can receive best. So are you interested in serving on our re-entry team as an usher, as a greeter, maybe on our AV team? People will train you and show you how to do it. So we are rebuilding all of our teams. We would love for you to be a part of it. Come help us reach people as we go back to some in-person experiences where people can feel God in a very tactile way, if you will, through connecting in physical space. So click on the link in the comments or click on the button on our website. It says re-entry and join us for the re-entry interest meeting so you can learn ways that you can serve with us to help us keep reaching people for Christ. All right, now for uh, this favoritism in the family, let me just say it briefly. It never helps anyone, but God somehow shows up in powerful ways. And so this morning, we're gonna talk about what it looks like, what it feels like, and how God works and acts in our lives, even through these experiences of favoritism. I'll be back at the end of the message. We'll talk some more then. Children, somebody said yes, please. Talk, talk, about, talk about my problem, Sharon, I got, yeah. Problem children, interestingly, uh, require a great deal of attention, like extraordinary levels of attention and resources. If you've ever had a problem sibling, y'all know what I'm saying. They were the one that mom and daddy always had to fix. They were trying to prop them up on every leaning side. Every time the police called, mom and daddy or mama or daddy or somebody had to pick up and go get them out of jail. They had to go and get them, get, get them out of trouble. They always bailed them out, problem children. And they're pro sometimes they're problem children in their adulthood. <laughs> and mama and daddy are still giving them undue and overwhelming attention. Come on and talk to me, somebody. Am I in your house this morning? Yeah. Um, problem children can oftentimes be seen as the favorite child of the other siblings. Why? Because they are getting all the attention that the other children are not getting. Whether the attention is positive or negative, attention is attention when you're a child. And if your siblings are getting all the attention, you feel neglected and abandoned and left out somehow. Yeah. Problem children, can, they, they create this whole conundrum of favoritism within the family dynamic. And some of you have siblings um, who were the favorite because they were the problem child. Because they always had all the attention, all the money, all the resources. And it was just assumed that because you were the good child, we'll come to you in a minute. That you didn't need any attention, you didn't need any celebration, you didn't need anybody to show up to your events, that you didn't have any crises in your life. Because you were seen, and here's the next P, as the perfect child. Perfect children, I think, are classically compliant. Y'all, this is too much counsel for y'all. Y'all ain't come for no counseling session, did you? Yeah, I'm preaching this morning. I just, just tell your neighbor, he is preaching. Yeah, he helping us. Yeah. All of y'all who are catching us by live stream, I know that you love this message. As for these ratchet saints here in the auditorium. <laughs> I'm messing with y'all. I'm messing with y'all. 
So, you know, these perfect children, they're compliant, they're malleable, they're amiable. They will do anything you want them to do because they don't want to create the friction that the problem child has been creating. They've seen the trouble. They said, Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. I don't want any of that trouble. They would rather just not get into all of that. They, whatever mom and daddy says, that's what they do. They want to keep the trouble down. They want to solve all the problems in the house. They don't want to cause any stink. So they become very compliant, and they look like the perfect child. You have to be careful of, of kids who appear to be the perfect child because what can happen is they can start to believe their own press. Yeah, never let a child in your home claim to be the perfect child. Just remind them, I appreciate you being compliant. I know that you want to do well, um, but you're a sinner just like everybody else. In fact, tell your perfect child, I would rather you be imperfect. I would rather you not live under the deception that somehow you're able, because they become people pleasers. And that's what a lot of us are. We are people pleasers. We're trying to please everybody. You tried to please mama, tried to please daddy, could never please them, and now you're still trying to please everybody. That's why you're always saying yes and can't say no. Somebody slap your neighbor, tell them, welcome to the counseling session. Yeah, they become pleasers or they become deceivers and they hide behind their air of perfection. So that the perfect child, one day you wake up and you're like, what the freak happened? <laughs> like you were the perfect child. How did you become such a mess? Oh, y'all not going to help me up in here. Yeah, be careful about promoting perfection in your family because it is a roadway to destruction for that people-pleasing, perfect presentation. Oh, my God, I feel, I feel a pea anointing on my life. And then there is the promised child. Cain was, in essence, the promised child. God told Adam and Eve, listen, your seed is going to fight against the devil and going to win, in essence. Eve thinks that Cain is the seed that God promised. But understand something, God knew that redemption would have to be for far more people. Amen. That his program would be worked out over generations of humanity. That is, by, by the way, why as we talk about this, you cannot simply think about you and your crib. In other words... The redemption that God wants to bring through the promised child who ultimately was Jesus is not just for me and my family. It is so that me and my family would get on God's program. We will be halfway functional, halfway sane, and be able to bless somebody else in the community. God didn't just come to redeem all of us. He came to redeem all of Owings Mills, all of Randallstown, all of Glendon, all of Baltimore. Y'all not going to help me up in here. Your problems may be your problems, but God wants to redeem your problems so that you and I can be a blessing to people far beyond us. But Cain is this promised child. Let me get back to this. And so when mama gets this baby, she never thought she was going to have. And some parents get a word. Y'all, any parents ever like, we didn't think we were going to have kids, and the Lord gave me a child. The promised child can become the favorite child. Like, this is the one God told me I was going to have. And so you would treat that child, particularly after other siblings come into the picture, as the prized possession. So, who did this? So Sarah, y'all remember Sarah? Lord told Abraham, listen, you're going to bless many nations. All these nations are going to come through you. Sarah's like, we ain't got no chair. <laughs> well, if God's going to bless us, maybe we need a baby. She said, I'll tell you what, go, you can sleep with my maidservant, Hagar. Tell your neighbor, don't do that. <laughs> don't do that. Don't do that. Yeah, don't do that. Ladies, never give your man to another woman. I just thought I better go ahead and throw that in there for some, for some of us who are working in desperation. You're trying to keep your man. You say, well, maybe I'll just share him with somebody. I keep half of them. No. 
But Sarah gets this, this little boy, Isaac, after Ishmael is born. He is the promised child. She clings to him so much so that he has a difficult time connecting with his own wife. I think I'm going somewhere. I'm going to come back to this next week, by the way, um, because some of us are frustrated because your spouse might have been favored by mama. All the mama's boys, just go ahead and wink. <laughs> Girlfriend, you've been trying to get him off them nipples for 30 years. I'm sorry, y'all. I'm sorry, y'all. <laughs> See, I can act, I act this way. Y'all know when the first lady's not here because I act crazy. I just act real simple. <laughs> She's traveling today. My daughter was visiting a grad school and they're on their way back. I'm going to behave. I'm going to behave. I'm going to behave. But promised children become problematic. So there are, uh, there's a problem child, the perfect child, the promised child, all become problems. The problem with favoritism is that all children need to be valued, but they also need to be trained. One of the ways you break the dysfunction of favoritism in your generation with your family uh, is that you have to value every child. You cannot build relationships just in groups, by the way not deep relationships. Every child needs individual attention and time. Every person needs individual attention and time. Watch this now. That's why even if you don't have children, couples, if you don't have children, you still need individual time with your spouse. And when the children come into the picture, your spouse still needs your individual attention. Some of y'all let the children run the insane asylum, the insane asylum, and they are wrecking the marriage. Because your spouse didn't get attention in the home he or she grew up in. They need your attention, but you're giving all the attention to the... I'm just going to sit down and talk to y'all. <laughs> I, just, I just feel like I, need, I just need to be conversational with y'all because this is way too much for a Sunday morning. Y'all okay with this? Okay, well, I'll go back and... Are y'all following what I'm saying to you? Yes. Children need th to be valued and they need to be trained. They need to be disciplined. So you cannot let the child who's problematic run the house. They need the discipline of boundaries, which says if you continue this way, we will find another place for you. You can't continue to disrupt the flow of this house. You can't just take over and soak up all the resources. We got five other children who need something up in here. But some of us are too scared to discipline our children. That's a whole nother teaching series. But they need discipline and they need value. They, even your bad kids need to know that you love them. Because some of us just cuss our bad children out. You so you you just not gonna be. I don't know what to do with you. You just you just insist on being crazy. I don't. Why 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 did God put you in my family? Why why we why, why are you here? You cannot talk to your children that way. God entrusted them to you. If God didn't think you were capable of blessing them and getting them over their hurdles, he would have never gave them to you, baby. Hurry up and get your own mind right so you don't help them to continue the madness in another generation. Maybe they are problematic, but they are looking to be valued and they need some boundaries. Children go crazy when they don't have the two things. Can I talk to you about some, some training and direction for your kids? I thought I was going to get to the frustrations, but I see we, we may. I don't know what to tell you. I'm trying. Um, training comes in two areas primarily. The one has to do with discipline. Turn with me to Hebrews. Yeah, we're not going to finish this. I'm sorry, y'all. I just get so much when I'm. Yeah, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> thank you, Lord. Come with me to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. Let's look at verses 5 through 11. Say amen when you're there. 
Hebrews chapter 2. Okay, here we go. Um, and have you forgotten the encouraging words God spoke to you as children? That's instructive, isn't it? He said, my child, don't make light of the Lord's discipline. And don't give up when he corrects you. That's a word. That, that, that's a word for Cain. Cain didn't get that word. He should have received that word. For the Lord disciplines those he loves. And he punishes each one he accepts as his child. Yeah, if I don't love you, I'm not going to discipline you. Some of us have to learn that discipline is a part of loving your children. I didn't say abuse was a part of loving your children. You can't beat children with frying pans and extension cords and coat hangers. Come on, y'all. Talk to me now. Yeah. Discipline. Training. By the way, training and discipline your, disciplining your child has to do with helping them learn how to respond to the voice of God to the correction of God. It has to do with helping them to honor God. It has to do with helping them to obey God. If I teach them to respond to God, to honor God, to obey God, they're going to be okay in life. But if they can't respond to and honor and obey God, then they're going to be jacked up. So we taught our children, listen, if you lie to me and if you rebel, I'm going to whoop your behind. We had two principles. That's all. Just don't lie. And don't just be belligerent like you're just going to do whatever you want to do. We said don't do that. First time obedience will be helpful to you. Otherwise, you'll meet Mr. Obey. He says, and let me just say this, by the way, because if you don't teach your children how to respond to authority, Reminding them that God wants this for you, not from you. He wants this for you. Then what will happen is they will keep pressing the limits of authority in their life. And then when the pastor speaks to them, they'll be like, who, who you think you is? I can tell what kind of conversation you have with your children at home by how your children respond to the pastor. And you endure this, as you endure this divine discipline, verse 7, remember that God is treating you as his own children. Who ever heard of a child who was never disciplined by his father? God says that's preposterous. If God doesn't discipline you as he does all of his children, it means that you are illegitimate and are not really his children at all. He says stop treating your children like God didn't give them to you. Stop treating your children uh, as if they are illegitimate. Somebody shout, discipline your children. Some of us grew up in homes where there was no discipline, there were no boundaries. And so we let the children, and some of us are, we are raising our children out of guilt. Like we give them everything and let them do anything and take them everywhere. And then if you say no to them, you feel guilty. Ah, uh, but Pookie really wanted. <laughs> How about, no, not today. When we can, we will. If we don't, that's cool too. Right. <laughs> All right, am I making sense to you? So, so that's one aspect of training. But then there's Proverbs 23, 6. Come with me. To Proverbs. You know this verse. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. How much time I got? I'm, I'm quickly running out of time. What time is it? What time y'all want to go home today? Okay, they said keep going. Okay, we got till 3 o'clock. All right. Uh, train up a child in the way he should go when he's old. He will not depart from it. This word train is powerful. It is a Hebrew word, hanak, which means narrow, discipline, dedicate. We get this word, uh, or related word, I should say, is Hanukkah. You guys heard that word, Hanukkah? It is a word that means consecrate or consecration. It is a consecration. Watch this now. 
Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. In other words, he says we have to, one, one translation says, train up a child according to his bent. We thought it had all to do with discipline and whooping the children. No, that's not what he means here. He says, your children are born with a bent, that's good. Wow. with a leaning. God put something in all of us. Some of us, the Bible says that, that Cain, um, Cain took to uh, farming and Abel took to, what did he take to? Her herding. Oh, he was a herdsman, Right. It's took to. That was a bent for them. God says, watch this now. What your parents may have missed was your bent. And consequently, subsequently, many of us are working in careers that we hate. Many of us have jobs that we just wish we never, and, we, and we've settled into them. It's been 25 years now. You've been doing it all these years. You were never designed to do that. But your parents did not have the biblical foresight and understanding. Don't hold us against them. Right. Don't go home talking about mama and see what you should have done. <laughs> Tell them they don't do that. Thank God for this word you're getting today. Right. You were bent one way, and God says you train up a child according to that bent. Here's what I had to learn about my son, for example. I don't, is he here? Jeremy's here? See, I almost missed this because I was too busy doing ministry. But I used to watch my son play Guitar Hero, and I was like, man, I can't, I can't even keep up with you. I'm like, man, I can't do Who does that? He would be playing Guitar Hero, and he would just, I'm like, how do you coordinate all of those chords? And the faster the game went, the more he kept up. Then he went through a concussion with football. And God began to steer him toward music. I was missing it on Guitar Hero. But then we began to notice his teachers started to tell us how good he was musically. Y'all following what I'm saying to you? So what we've decided is that in the interest of being parents who train our children in the way we should go, let's get behind everything that has to do with music in your life. You cannot... Observe your children's bent wow. if you do not spend time with them. Wow. Yeah, some of us are missing our children's bents because we're not spending enough time with them. I talked to Baltimore County Police and I asked them, what's the number one problem in this community? They said, oh, the number one problem is kids who don't have the, the attention of their parents. It's juvenile troubles. They said it's irritating stuff. They, they're just angry because their parents are never home. Because both parents work, and they're working 40, 50, 60, 80 hours a week. They're frustrated. Train up a child in the way that he should go. When he's old, he will not depart from it. There is a bit that your children have. Observe how they're made, what they like. And watch this now. Some of us have our children fried and burnt out. Because you got them at basketball practice, soccer practice, football practice, art club, music club, dilly-dalliers. You got, we got them at everything after school on one day. But they're not good at basketball. <laughs> I mean, they, <laughs> there's a reason the coach doesn't put Pookie in. Pookie is not good at basketball. Stop fighting with the coach. Stop talking. It's not personal. They, they don't hate you. They're not against your child. Pookie is not good. Come on, say that with me. Pookie is not good. Figure out what your children are good at and move them in that direction. They will celebrate you as you celebrate them. And in doing so, you help them discover God's mission for their lives. Amen. See, we got to get through this favoritism thing, and we got to begin to observe our children in order to break these cycles of dysfunction. 
They need to be celebrated and they need to be trained. Amen. They need to be valued. They need to be disciplined. Y'all following what I'm saying to you? I shared this teaching on favoritism several years ago, but it's still so powerful and relevant today because people still experience the pain of having um, been sort of disregarded for the favorite child. And some people experience the fallout of having been the favorite child. I don't know what dynamic you experienced in your family or even what is happening in your current family life. But I do want you to know, God wants you to know that you can be a favorite with him. He wants you to know that you can be favored by him and no one else has to lose out because you're favored. I wanna pray for you this morning, no matter what dynamic it was in your life. But before I pray, I want you to reflect on a couple of questions very quickly. I want you to ask, what was it like to be the favorite if you were the favorite? Or what was it like to not be the favorite. And I want you to get real honest. I want you to think about that. What did it feel like? What, did, what was the experience? Here's the a, here's a third question I want you to, to ask. What went missing and what do I need that only God can give me so that I don't have to live as this favored child, humanly speaking, or dismissed? or disrespected or disregarded is probably the better word. What do I need from God? I wanna be, be God's favored child. What is it that I need from him? Maybe you need God to pull you close. Maybe you need words of affirmation. Maybe you need God to whisper to you that you matter more than anything. So I want you to reflect on that, but I wanna pray for you right now as we conclude our service. Say thank you for worshiping with us today. So glad you were here, so glad you were a part of this. And I pray that it blessed you and encouraged you and gave you insight that will help you get closer to God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you that you change us by your word. Thank you for insights from your word. Thank you for giving us life by your word. Now God, I pray for every person who experienced, Lord, the pain that comes from uh, families that play favorites. I pray for healing for them in the strong and great name of Jesus, our Savior. May you, uh, may you draw nearer to them, God, than they've ever known before. Give them what they stand in need of. Remind somebody today that when they're connected to you, they have your favor, no matter what men say, do, or think. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, have a great week. Talk to you soon. Thank you.